Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, unschooling mom and author, bringing you interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free Exploring Unschooling ebook, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 20 of the podcast. It's the 18th of May, 2016, as I record this intro. In this episode, I speak with Dr. Carlo Ricci about unschooling in the context of alternative education. He and his wife have unschooled their two daughters over the years, and he teaches graduate students about alternative education at the Schulich School of Education at Nipissing University here in Ontario, Canada. It's a fascinating discussion, which I think I said too many times over the course of the interview. But hearing the unschooling lifestyle we're living every day described in more academic terms, yet still completely focused on love, trust, respect, and compassion is really interesting. Carlo and I talk about learning to read and how it happens naturally at different ages. I enjoyed touching on this topic with him. And in fact, I have a whole episode about children learning to read in their own time coming up soon. Uh, We also talk about a phrase he uses regularly, children are capable, and his perspective on his daughter's choosing to go to school right now and what he does to mitigate the more negative effects. We also touch on the differences between unschooling and democratic schools and his experience as founder and editor of the Journal of Unschooling and Alternative Learning. When I asked him how he would re-envision childhood, Carlo makes a great point. To him, it's all about relationships which ties in so nicely with what many 10 Questions guests have shared on the podcast as the most valuable outcome of unschooling for them, namely the strong, connected, and wonderful relationships they have with their children, even as teens and young adults. Carlo doesn't envision a huge shift of the physical world, but rather he values the internal shifts that change how we see the world. It's not big things that need to happen, but a bunch of little things. So he chooses to focus on the ideas of love, trust, respect, care, compassion, freedom, democracy, authentic experiences, and having young people determine what, when, where, how they want to learn, and how these internal shifts will create an environment for young people where they can live and thrive. In essence, a world that is a lot friendlier, gentler, and more loving for young people. I also love his point that there is so much value in unschooling families just doing what they do in the world, real examples of living and learning without school, both for people around us who now see that school isn't the only choice, and for alternative education proponents within the system who can take their conversations beyond the theoretical by pointing out those of us who are already doing it. As an update, uh, things have been pretty quiet around here this week. I'm working on edits for the Unschooling Journey book, which is based on my blog series from last year about unschooling in the context of Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. The book is growing so beautifully as my co-author, Amy carpenter Lutz is adding wonderful myths and fairy tales to more effectively illustrate the different stages, as well as some of her own unschooling stories. I am super excited about this project. And for the quote this week, I'm actually pulling from the interview. Carlo reads something that John Holt wrote in Growing Without Schooling, issue 13, in a section titled Going Back. A number of parents, perhaps half a dozen or so, have written to me to say that one or more of their children have chosen to go back to school. They sound a little apologetic about this, as if they thought they had betrayed the cause, in quotes. But there is nothing at all to feel apologetic about. In the first place, unschooling is not a, quote, cause. Our interest is not in causes, but in children and their growth, their learning, and their happiness. Unschooling is a lifestyle, and as Holt so eloquently points out, our family and our children, their growth, learning, and happiness are the point of this journey, not the act of unschooling itself. We are choosing unschooling in support of our children. And as I mentioned earlier, as I'm editing the Unschooling Journey book, In it, I spend quite a bit of time talking about how our children are our most important guides. And Carlo and I talk about this in the interview as well, how much we learn from our children, including how best to support them as they live and learn and explore their world every day. As I said, it's a fascinating conversation, and I hope you enjoy it too. 
If you have any thoughts you'd like to add, just head on over to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and share in the comments for episode 20. And now on to the interview with Carla. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca. And today I'm here with Carlo Ricci. Hi, Carlo. Hi, Pam. It's great to have you on the show. Uh, as a bit of an introduction, Carlo teaches graduate students at the Schulich School of Education at Nipissing University in Ontario, Canada. His research focus and teaching includes unschooling, self-directed learning, reading, free schooling, and democratic education. He and his wife have also unschooled their own daughters over the years. He founded and edits the Journal of Unschooling and Alternative Learning, is the author of The Willed Curriculum, Unschooling and Self-Direction, What to Love, Trust, Respect, Care and Compassion Have to Do with Learning, and he co-edited both The Legacy of John Holt and Natural Born Learners. So let's dive in, Carlo. Can you share with us a bit about your background and your family? Sure. I'm happy to be here and uh, look forward to our conversation. And- oh, me too. <laughs> so my wife and uh, two girls, who are currently uh, 11 and 13, have always had the freedom to live their life, and they get to make decisions about what to eat, how to dress, and so on. So we like to give them as much freedom as possible. That's awesome. Well, how did you discover unschooling then? Well, I was never a fan of schooling itself, and in searching for alternatives, I just stumbled upon it, and it uh, resonated with me immediately. Did you find it uh, before you were before you had kids, or um, was that through your education, like through your uh, teachers' college and stuff? Well, no, I didn't learn any of this while I was uh, in faculties of education, um, or when I was doing my masters and my PhD. Actually, I learned it on my own, parallel to all of those things. So. Uh, people might assume that I have some type of degree in alternative learning and I, you know, studied John Holt in a university <laughs> kind of thing. But uh, the truth is that uh, everything that I'm interested in now and everything that I'm sharing with you now is something that I've learned on my own in my own time. So in a sense, it's it's really come from unschooling myself. That's awesome. Um, a few years ago, you spoke at the Toronto Unschooling Conference about learning to read naturally, and I loved your talk there. Can you share some of your thoughts behind how people learn to read on their own at different ages? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think everyone is different, and they learn in their own ways. Young people are capable of creating their own curriculum, which is something I strongly believe in, and they can figure out what it is they need to do to learn to read. So one of my uh, students um, recently shared with me in one of my courses how his daughters wanted to go to a reptile facility, for example. And uh, what she would do is she would go to this particular facility. She wanted to go on a daily basis and she asked the person who worked there the same questions over and over again. And uh, my point is that this young person, by doing that, really was in tune with what she needed to do in order to uh, learn what she was interested in learning about. So uh, she knows what she needed, uh, you know, perhaps repetition in this case, which is a good way to learn something. And uh, similar things are happen with reading. So, for example, each of my daughters did different things to learn uh, when they wanted to learn how to read. Uh, some of the things I was able to grasp and others that were much more private and invisible for me to to sort of make out what exactly they were doing. So, for example, uh, you know, they read on their own and they asked us from the other room what, you know, this particular word spells and they would share the letters with us. Uh, they would learn to read as they write things down. Uh, they observed print all around us in our home and we, we went out and walked around our neighborhood. Uh, so they really learned to read in their own way. And while they were in charge of of deciding and determining how that would look for them and each of them picked their own path. And as I said before, some of the things I could grasp, you know, and, and try to figure out what they were doing, but other things are just invisible to me and perhaps even invisible to them as they were just living their life, trying to figure out what all of this print means, um, you know, in the world and so on. And there is no one program that fits everyone and we have to trust and respect their process and the time that they need in order to figure out what it means to read and how they could 
you know, learn how to read. And they create a much more rigorous curriculum for themselves than anything that we could actually create for them. And it doesn't have to be top down. So as humans, I think that we are learners and uh, we can naturally learn things in our own way. And in the process, we learn about learning and we learn about what works for us, which are both very important things, I think, for everyone to um, to sort of tune into. So rather than learning to wait for others to teach us, uh, I think they just figure out that they could learn on their own and they could figure out what it is that they need to learn, which is, I think, extremely powerful. Uh, for example, I often hear my own students sometimes say, no one ever taught me that, so how am I supposed to know that? Uh, they didn't teach me that in teacher's college. And so rather than that, uh, they should say, uh, and I think it would be more powerful and prudent if they could just say that they wanted to know and so went out and learned it in their own way. So if you don't know it, don't blame others for not teaching you, but simply go out and learn it. And if you want to know it, then uh, go out and learn it. And I think everyone is capable of, of using these particular skills. So when it comes to reading, I think everybody is capable of creating their own very individual program and they could determine what it is that they need at in the moment in order to learn how to read and every human being would do that in slightly different ways yeah you had some great points in there that uh, how individuals will have their own program and and the thing is it, like you said it's not that they even really recognize it it's just what they're doing right it's just what they're drawn to do in the moment it's not like they say okay i'm going to focus now on learning to read or something it's just it's totally part of life for them right mm -hmm. yeah and it could be conscious sometimes or it could be yeah. something that's more uh, or less you know uh, something that they're not really mindful of in the moment and they're just mm -hmm. in their life and they just uh, learn it so I think there are all kinds of different ways to learn things and uh, we shouldn't create particular hierarchies where we say that this way of learning is much better than that way of learning. And so if you learn it uh, this way, we will applaud you. And if you learn it in a different way and in a different time, uh, then, you know, we're going to not value it as much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a big piece, a big piece of it. Now, in your answer there, you use the phrase a couple of times, and I've heard you use it regularly over the years, and it's one I love, and it's children are capable, because I love how it so concisely conveys the idea that children aren't blank slates that need to be taught things, but they're born curious and creative, and they are already able to learn. So I was hoping you could talk a bit about the inspiration you had behind that phrase. Well, <clears throat> just by noticing what my own children do and noticing what we all do in the world and to uh, just pay particular attention to young people. It's pretty obvious that they're capable of determining their own life, of making substantive decisions that are, uh, you know, valuable, worthwhile and helpful for them. Um, you know, as they live, they learn all about these different types of things. So they're, you know, they're capable of learning about living and uh, learning about learning. And my children, for example, have shown, have, you know, shown me over and over again how true this is. From a very early age, they want to and can contribute to our world and our family in very meaningful ways. And they're not helpless. They're, you know, very capable of, of living a, a, you know, a meaningful and uh, life where they contribute to the world that they live in. So true. Once you give them the space to to actually, you know, think for themselves and make choices, it's amazing what they can what they can come up with. Right. I mean, I I go to my kids even when they were younger, you know, for real, real input into our situations. Right. That's so helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the unexpected but wonderful things about unschooling's wider perspective on lifelong learning is how often we ourselves, oh, there, that led nicely, <laughs> learn from our children. I was hoping you could share a couple of things that you've learned over the years from your children. Well, I'm constantly learning from, you know, my, my children. Um, from the time they were younger to now, it's, it's a constant, uh, you know, just very wonderful thing to witness. And 
you know, for example, learning about how capable they are is something that that is um, shouldn't be surprising to so many of us. But once we give them the space and the place to to sort of live authentic, genuine freedom, democracy, uh, authenticity, as I said, you know, all of these types of of ways, you know, with love and trust and respect and care and compassion, we can quickly grasp how, um, you know, how they could uh, just thrive. And so in terms of uh, things that I've learned from them, you know, I've learned how capable young people actually are. And the myth, of course, is that they're not and they're they really need adults to do all kinds of things to support them. Um, and that uh, we don't give them the trust and respect that they uh, they actually need. So I, I've learned from them for sure how capable young people are. And just by noticing the different types of things that they do, I, I learn a lot about learning and how people learn things because that's something that I'm interested in. So just looking at them and, and, and just being with them and just learning about how they learn about things gives me insights into learning in general. And it also gives me insights into how I could better in my own life learn about things. Um, you know, I also learn about how they could... In, you know, in, in they taught me basically how to eat uh, more nutritionally just by me observing them. When I was younger, um, you know, like many of us, I was force fed, for example. So, you know, you had to sit at the table, you had to eat everything on your plate. You wouldn't you weren't able to to leave until uh, everything was finished and so on. Well, that wasn't like that ever for my young people, you know, for my children. So they always had the freedom to decide what to eat, when to eat, where to eat, you know. So um, they uh, they taught me about how uh, naturally that type of transition can happen. And um, so, you know, for example, uh, they instead of eating everything on their plate, they always leave things. And when they're full, they're full. So they taught me the importance of being really in tuned and trying to listen to our own bodies and in trying to become healthier um, eaters. And, and you would think that if, you know, young people had the option of eating chocolates and cookies and all the things that we consider, you know, junk food, that that's all they would consume. And of course, my children have the freedom of, of having any of those things anytime they like. But what's really interesting in this whole process, and which is eye opening uh, for me and, and maybe for others is that even though they have the option of eating only those types of things, they actually create a very nutritious uh, plan for themselves, right? So it, it's not that they're constantly eating junk food, even though that that's something that they can do, but they they eat nutritious foods. They prefer sometimes to have, uh, you know, legumes and, you know, a lot of beans and whatever it is that they, um, that they want to have that are very nutritional over food that isn't as nutritional. And because they've always had this freedom to make these types of choices, it's really interesting for me to just watch how they learn about their own bodies. They learn about nutrition. You know, they learn about what types of foods make them feel one way versus what types of foods make them feel another. And the other interesting thing is that, you know, sometimes just like everybody, they want to have, uh, you know, food that is less nutritious for dinner. And what I've noticed is that because they have the freedom to have just that, if that's what they choose to have, they don't overeat because when I look at other examples uh, of children, for example, that I witness or instances that I witness, I see that before they can have their dessert, for example, they have to consume all of their food first and then they could have dessert, which results in them having their dessert when they're already full. So, you know, it leads to this cycle of overeating and so on and so forth. But with my children, I noticed that since they can have just dessert, they'll have just a little piece of dessert because that's what it is, what it is that they want. And then they go off and then later on they can have their fruit. They can have whatever it is, their vegetables, whatever it is that they choose to have on their own time. And so it really um, creates a very interesting 
Um, and for me, in, in their case, and of course, people are different, so not everybody will follow this particular plan. But from my children, that's definitely something that I've noticed and that I was able to take away from how. Um, and I've actually implemented that in my own life, um, trying very hard to do what they do so naturally. And um, it's worked out really well for me as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I've I've read read your book about uh, eating and weight. That uh, was really interesting. And it's just so your point about um, how from watching our kids, we learn how people naturally learn. I didn't know that would be so interesting, but it was completely fascinating. And as you say, it it really helped me even just in ways to um, well, more joyfully approach my day because I saw, you know, when they were having fun um, and enjoying what they were doing, how intense the experience and the learning and everything was. So, you know, that whole dichotomy I grew up with, with play versus work, right? It just, it really, really doesn't apply when you're playing and engaged and in the flow. There's just so much awesome stuff going on there. Absolutely. And even this whole notion of play, I think, becomes um, co-opted in a lot of ways. I, I just the other day, I met with somebody who is instrumental in um, creating the new play based learning document for kindergarten in Ontario. And, um, you know, she and I were having a conversation. And what I said was, you know, a lot of people I hear saying, you know, teachers and my students and so on who are teachers, um, they talk about how there's play in Ontario. That's the whole basis of the kindergarten program is play. And of course, what you know, the first thing I wanted to make clear to her and, and to see if she and I were in agreement, and fortunately we were, is that there's a huge difference between play and play-based learning. So in Ontario, we don't have play, but we have what's called play-based learning, which is very different. So play, to me, is authentic. It's genuine. It's something that you do, um, you know, uh, through freedom and uh, it's very it's very open and play based learning, you know, with play, of course, there's learning, but the focus isn't learning. It's the focus is always the play part. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, in Ontario. And as I said, she agreed clearly uh, with me that when you talk about play based learning, it's not so much about that. The curriculum come first. So play based learning in kindergarten in Ontario is exactly that. You know, it's exactly that. And in fact, she uh, mentioned that in 2006, when the document came out, they called it uh, learning based play, um, you know. And so, uh -huh. you know, people, I think, get confused between authentic, genuine free play and this whole notion of play based learning that's within the kindergarten in Ontario. And again, that play based learning is very much focused on the learning component of it, which is externally imposed, which is top down, which, you know, everything we know about uh, what mainstream schooling is about. Yeah, that's a great distinction. You know, it reminds me of like video games and educational computer games. <laughs> right. it's like, yeah, they should enjoy it because because it's on the computer. But no, I mean, the way that the, the games are organized, it's learning first. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, I was wondering too, what your, I know one of your daughters has chosen to go to school. Um, I was wondering what that choice looked like and how you continue to bring your unschooling perspective on living and learning into your days with school in the mix. Right. <clears throat> For me, it's very simple. Um, the fact that they choose to go to school is in my mind consistent with the worldview and the spirit of unschooling. So in a number of places, um, Pat Frang and I, uh, are just in the process of bringing out all 141 issues of growing without school in a whole bunch of, uh, you know, it'll amount to a whole bunch of volumes. And so the first volume is almost ready, which will have between issues one and 19 or one and 20. And so in, you know, uh, doing that, I've just finished uh, reading every single word of growing without schooling magazine, you know, from, 
the first issue through the the 20th again in the last week, just as a final proofread for this. And so in a number of places, Holt shares the same sentiment um, that, you know, with this whole notion of, of schooling and so on. And I'll, I'll read you a bit. Um, it's for from... Um, you know, for example, in issue 13 of Growing Without Schooling, in a section titled Going Back, Holt writes, A number of parents, perhaps half a dozen or so, have written to me to say that one or more of their children have chosen to go back to school. They sound a little apologetic about this, as if they thought they had betrayed and, in quotes, the cause. But there is nothing at all to feel apologetic about. In the first place, unschooling is not a cause, in quotes. Our interest is not in causes, but in children and their growth, their learning, and their happiness. So as a loving father, of course, I support the decision that my children make. Also, um, they go uh, to school, but they are very aware of the hypocrisy of what goes on there. So we talk a lot about it, and they share a lot about the absurdity of it. So my daughter and I joke that one day we will co-author a paper about the ingenious ways that she and her friends use mechanisms of resistance to gain some sanity within the system. Um, so how they try and subvert the absurd rules and regulations that are placed on them. And I'm sure uh, I'm not sure why my children go. Uh, I have asked them, but in the end, there must be enough there to keep them going. They don't find it schoolwork that is, you know, difficult. Um, so that part is not enough to keep them away from the benefits they gain, perhaps in the form of relationships and friendships and so on. Uh, maybe they like the praise they get since they are, you know, quote unquote, good at schooling. I'm not sure. They do have insightful observations and complaints about what does not work for them. As for me, I wish they did not go. But, you know, again, as a loving father, I support their choice. I also try to mitigate the damage that I perceive the schools do to them. You know, the anxiety, uh, the absurdity of it, where they're being told what to do top down. The time it takes them um, wanting to do what really matters to them, um, you know, because they're in school, so they can't do these particular things. I've always stayed away from their schooling. I, uh, you know, I don't read or look at their reports and tell them that I know them. And I love them and know how capable they are and that I don't need strangers formally telling me about my children. So regardless what the schools say, I know them intimately. And so I, you know, trust and respect everything that, that they choose to do as human beings. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that, Carlo. It's it, it, un, the unschooling lifestyle, you know, supports so much more than just the actual school, right? It's just a whole perspective on the way you live. And, and I love the way you talk about talk about that. And they get the opportunity, as you said, to talk to you so much about that. So as you're saying, you're mitigating a lot, hopefully, a lot of the more negative influences, right? Right. And again, to me, unschooling is a worldview. It's a way of life. It's the way you approach yeah. everything. And so you could learn about it any way you, you know, learn about anything any way you like. And some people want to go to YouTube and some people want to talk to other people. And some people might want to take a course about how to learn about a particular thing. Over the years, I've seen democratic schools described as unschooling schools a number of times, and yet I think there are some distinct differences between the two environments. I was wondering what some of the differences are that you see. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, I think that those you know, democratic schools are better than mainstream schools, but in the end, they're still schools in the sense that they separate children from other learning spaces and places. So, for example, if someone wanted to be a, a medical doctor, let's say, uh, many people's dreams for themselves and their children, uh, then I would suggest that they get themselves into places and spaces where they can learn what that means, uh, what it means to be in that particular profession. I was at a conference recently and um, I heard a statistic that 17% of Canadian adults are happy with the line of work that 
uh, and that includes all professionals, including you know doctors and so on. So this is telling uh, and very troubling for me that only 17% of Canadian adults are happy with the type of work that they're in. And so you know, you have to ask yourself, is there a systemic reason for this? Would things be different if young people had opportunities to experience these professions earlier? So if we adopted this whole unschooling model where, you know, for example, if you wanted to be a doctor, then spend your time learning what that means as soon as you think that might be an area you wanted to go into. And then once you determine that you actually would like to pursue that as a career, then learn everything you can about it first and then go off and get credentialed. You see, I think we do things backwards where, you know, they go to, we go to school first or, you know, um, in the world that we live in. And then after that, you, you choose a profession, uh, you go into the schooling for that. And then after you go into it and you realize, wow, this is nothing uh, that I thought it would be. And I don't like it at all. Right. So it would be, yeah. it, mind better if we didn't do it in this backwards way but instead we would spend a whole bunch of time immersed in this as soon as we think it's something that we're interested in and then move forward that way yeah i think that's a great piece um another one that i was that i i notice is you know there's the choice, yes, you have a choice to do uh, what you do when you're there, but there's you don't have as much choice. There's still compulsory attendance. You have to, you know, get up, get out, and get there first off. So, you know, there's that aspect that I think is very different. And then there was one other one that, that has and come to me a few times. Nothing that Sorry? replicates. And, of course, there's nothing that replicates learning in the world itself, right? So learning about yeah. being a doctor in a textbook or in an institution or in a closed environment is very different than actually going to a hospital and and spending time there and learning about what that means there and same thing with any other profession right so if you want to learn to be a carpenter you know is it better to be out in the field with people who are doing that and watching and learning and participating and and you know immersing yourself in it that way rather than going to an institution where you're going to get credentialed right and as John Holt said, more and more of the professions that that used to be done without credentialing are now uh, required, you know, credentialing is now required to do them. So, yeah, I, we seem to have moved in that direction where, you know, they want to set up professional organizations and, you know, give certificates for just about anything that they can that they can try and commoditize, I guess. Right. Yeah. Um, there was one other difference that I wanted to chat with you about. Um, it's the idea when, cause when I think about learning, um, and I watch my kids over the years, uh, one of the things that I, I find that they love, you know, is when they get into the flow, um, which, you know, Mihai Cheek sent Mihai talks about in his book, finding flow as the joy of complete engagement. And that's something we see in our kids pretty regularly. And, the interesting thing is, um, when he talks about it, he, t he says, uh, when goals are clear, feedback relevant, and challenges and skills are in balance, attention becomes ordered and fully invested. Because of the total demand on psychic energy, a person in flow is completely focused. There's no space for consciousness, for distracting thoughts, irrelevant feelings. Self-consciousness disappears, yet one feels stronger than usual, and the sense of time is distorted. I think one of the key aspects, you know, from watching my kids and for myself is that disappearance of self-consciousness when you're getting into the flow. You know, you drop that layer of internal analysis and you just get right into it. And we feel freer to experiment, to think outside the box, to ask, you know, seemingly dumb questions that are on the tip of our tongue, because um, we know those answers are going to bring us the most clarity right in that moment. But to get to that space of... Um, lack of self-consciousness you really need to have uh, a space where they feel safe and he goes on to write about how the family seems to act as a protective environment where a child can experiment in relative security without having to be self-conscious and worry about being defensive or competitive so for me i think this is another way in which unschooling shines because unschooling parents are there with them in that environment and fo they're focused on creating that emotionally safe place for them to explore and learn Yep. No, I think uh, that Mahali Chicks at Mahali is is very good example of 
you know, of, of something or, you know, the way he writes about those things that you just mentioned that is transferable to what it is that we're interested in when we talk about this whole notion of unschooling and authenticity and self-determination and what I call willed learning. Uh, I think mm-hmm. it all comes together in a, in a very nice, clear way, along with notions of mindfulness and, and so on. It's very holistic. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Uh, next question. You are the founder and editor of the Journal of Unschooling and Alternative Learning, which is published through Nipissing University, and it's coming up on its 10-year anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you. And through it, uh, you publish a wide range of peer-reviewed articles from around the world. So I was wondering, what's been your favorite part of that experience and what kind of feedback you get from your readers? Well, it's it's really been... Uh, more than what I could have anticipated it being. It's just, um, it's such a wonderful experience and it's put me in a position where I get to meet and connect with other uh, scholars who have very similar interests. And it also opens up the community for me. And um, I get very, very positive reviews uh, from around the world and, and emails from people from around the world. And people have started book clubs and and um, uh, where even where homeschooling wasn't legal um, and they used the Journal of Unschooling and Alternative Learning as a as a way of bringing people into the um, the community and to open up conversations about what can be done. So it's really been a, a wonderful experience. It helped me form relationships, build community. Um, I just, I feel very, very fortunate to, um, you know, to be part of and uh, to have founded and continue to edit the Journal of Unschooling and Alternative Learning. And as you say, it's been going for 10 years and, um, you know, there's no sign of it slowing down. Oh, that's awesome. I'm so glad that it's been going well. I I really enjoy when I uh, see that there's a new issue out. <laughs> Last question. I was wondering, if you had a magic wand, how would you re-envision childhood in our society? <clears throat> that's a good question. I, I think what <laughs> I focus on is, is this whole notion of love, trust, respect, care, compassion, freedom, democracy, authentic experiences, genuine experiences, uh, determine, you know, f- to have young people determine what, when, where, how they want to learn. And I think all of those um, terms coming together would create a space and a place for young people where they could live and thrive and to really become who they know they can become and want to become. That's awesome. <laughs> those are, um, those really are, you know, the, the words um, that encompass the whole um, environment, you know, that we're trying to create with unschooling. I was all... Uh, could you dig a little bit deeper if we were to try and transition from where we are now into that? Like, would you um, try to come up with, uh, like, community spaces and stuff that people could, uh, that children could come to during the day? Or uh, would you try and come up with ways for it to be more family-based? What do you think? Well, I think it, it has to come from within. So I think rather than re-envisioning the world on the outside we need to re-envision how we see the world from the inside so it's very simple thing for us to do to change the world and i think that if you if you think about it this way that we're all part of the world we live in and so if we change our own uh you know minds spirits emotions and bodies and we're part of the world. By doing that, we will change the world. So I think what we need to do is we need to start small. We don't have to envision this, uh, you know, huge shift that needs to happen before anything can happen. But all we need to do is we need to shift our own worldviews, shift how we see the world, shift our own philosophical perspectives. And if each of us does that, then we would have 
you know, already made the shift that needs to happen in order for our world to be a lot friendlier for young people, a lot gentler for young people, a lot more loving for young people. So it's nothing that um, that's impossible, but it's very, very possible. And it's nothing that's overly complicated where you have to, you know, rebuild a whole city. You just have to think, uh, you know, your and change your own worldview, your own outlook, your own perspective. It's all about relationships. So, you know, what we're talking about now and even unschooling, to me, it's not just about learning and it's not just about young people, but it's about relationships. It's about community. It's about how we interact with each other, how we treat each other, how we help each other, how we, you know, we we take the time to uh, to notice that somebody is is needs our care or needs our compassion. And then we just move in that particular direction. So. It's not big things that have to happen, but a whole bunch of little things that each and every one of us are capable of doing. And the more people that choose to do that, the closer we are to envisioning a world that's a lot gentler and a lot friendlier. So that's what I think needs to happen. Yeah, I think that's a great point, because I remember when I first took the kids out of school, when I was talking to people that, you know, I would get, you know, the feedback, oh, you should stay in the system and try and change it from within and that kind of stuff. But no, it felt much better to, you know, just be ourselves and do what worked well for us and, and you know, treat our children the way we wanted children to be treated. And and then we are just a living example of, of a different way that that's uh, possible. Not only that, I think it's also uh, wonderful that you did that because it, it actually um, gives real life examples of how and what can happen. So that's why it's really wonderful that we do have these alternative schools, these democratic schools and free schools, and that we have people who are unschooling and we have examples of all of these uh, you know, different models, these different approaches that are working. And, and so for it, you know, even when I talk to my own students, I, I constantly remind them that what I'm talking about isn't just theoretical. So when I'm saying unschooling is a good option and it works and it's, you know, it creates uh, wonderful adults and so on that participate in our world, it's not just theory, it's actually happening. And all we have to do is we have to look at examples of people that are unschooling, people that are in, you know, free schools and democratic schools. And we also have to look at our own lives, right? Because each and every one of us learns about things and without going to school, like there are some things, you know, most of what we learn is stuff that we learn in different ways. So in a sense, every single person on the planet is unschooling. They've all learned about things by not going to school and they've all learned about things in ways that are very meaningful and self-determined or willed from their perspective. And so when I talk to my students, it's very empowering to say that, you know, imagine how much more difficult it would be to say, oh no, there's there's this alternative. Do you know anybody who's ever done it? No, no, but you know, in theory it really works. You know, that would make it much more <laughs> difficult. But to say that, look, there's every single person on the planet is doing this in some shape or form. There are people who do it more focused, like unschoolers and, uh, you know, people who go to free schools and democratic schools and Sudbury schools and so on, really allows uh, for a different level of conversation to happen because you could point to it and say, this is exactly what I'm talking about. And all of these people, you know, there are two and a half million homeschoolers in the U.S. and, you know, who knows the numbers in, in Canada go from 40,000 to 100,000. You know, these are all guesstimates. But uh, there are a lot of people that are doing this. And so uh, it's great to be able to point to it and say that, look, this is the vision that I'm talking about. And these are all the people that are already doing it. So the fact that you've taken that initiative, you know, John Holt talks about how it's great to make a hole in the fence and allow anybody to escape to escape. And so the fact that you and your family has escaped really is a testament to how successful it is when people do choose to escape. And so it's nothing to fear, but it's something to embrace. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's really one of the big pieces, I think, right, is is just letting people know that there are valid choices. 
you know, in, yes. in their child's education. Cause I mean, I mean, I didn't know there were any choices when my, my kids first went to school. So just like, like you say, when you're sharing with your students that there are valid choices that people are doing out there, I think even just knowing that more generally that, that will, uh, that will help a lot, I think. Absolutely. And what really um, was a, you know, a pleasant surprise for me in a sense is, you know, I've been doing this for a, a long number, you know, since 2002, I've been uh, teaching to graduate students. And what's really interesting is that a lot of them, when they initially come in, know very little, if anything, about homeschooling and, and these different options. Uh, what's really fascinating is, is that these uh, you know, that they're now not only as they learn about these other opportunities and these other options that are there, because as I said, you know, they not, a lot of them knew very little about what homeschooling means. And so they didn't know, do you have to test or, you know, is it legal? And what do you have to do? Do you have to be a certified teacher in order to homeschool and so on and so forth? So once they realized and learned more about it, they readily embraced it and they adopted it for their own life and their own families. So they started to homeschool and unschool their own children. And over the years, I've had, you know, dozens of students who've actually taken that as a, as an option. And I've also had um, students that are homeschoolers in my graduate program. Um, one of my students just completed her um, thesis uh, or, or um, uh, master's thesis on becoming a um, you know, her homeschooling experience. I have another PhD student who's homes unschooling her children, who's writing about that. And so it's, it's really wonderful to see that once people learn about it, a lot of, it becomes very normalized and it becomes a very good other option. And um, it really is hopeful that the more exposure people get to it, the more they recognize how good of an opportunity it is. That's fascinating, Carlo. I loved it. And I wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. It's been a fascinating conversation. No problem. I always enjoy talking to you, Pam. Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, before you go, I was just wondering where the best place is for people to connect with you online. Well, um, yeah, the best is probably my email address, um, which is Carlo R C A R L O R at nipissingu.ca, that's N-I-P-I-S-S-I-N-G-U dot C-A. Well, that's awesome. Thanks again. You're very welcome. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. You can also get your free Exploring Unschooling ebook at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash exploring unschooling. If you'd like to connect, you can also find me on Facebook at Living Joyfully. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.